Hi, I'm Devon. Welcome to West B. Join us for our Wednesday night activities. Kids Quest, three years to fifth grade, meet in the kids hallway, and students, six to 12th grade, have impact on the second floor. Adults will attend Bible study or discipleship groups. Check out wed.westb.org for a list of groups. Classic choir as well as worship choir rehearse too. It all starts at 6.15 p.m. Join the life group today. Classes are available for all age groups, including adults at 9.30 and 11. Visit the Welcome Center before or after services and check out what's available and join a group today. Have you subscribed? Our weekly newsletter is where you will find details about what's happening around the church, mission opportunities, and so much more. Subscribe now at newsletter.westb.org. Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us, come rest on us, come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us, come rest on us, come rest on us, come down, Spirit.
Why did God select the disciples to be the first followers of Jesus? And what was it about Mary and Joseph uh, that they would raise the Christ child? Were they somehow special? I mean, these, these first followers of Jesus, were they special? No, they weren't. In fact, they were ordinary. But God sovereignly chose them. So what is the story of the disciples? And, and what can we learn from them? In many ways, you will recognize them because they're approachable, like a friend. You will recognize them because they're ordinary. None of them were scholars. They were not famous. They didn't have great religious or political power. In fact, they were outsiders to the power structure of the religious establishment. Following Christ made them rebels in a way. They, they cut against the stream of the culture at the time. As we walk through the series, you're also going to see how they made a lot of mistakes. These disciples had doubts about their faith. They were sometimes slow learners, stubborn even. And at times, they frustrated each other. They even frustrated God. If you look at Matthew 26, verse 56, it says, Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. So we get to the end of the Gospels, where Jesus is about to be crucified. He's about to be arrested and taken to trial. And what do the disciples do? They run away. So it wasn't just Judas who betrayed Jesus. They all denied him. How did God redeem them? We'll be learning about that throughout this series. So these disciples were pretty much from Galilee, which is an agricultural region at the time. And they had a variety of backgrounds. One of them was a zealot, a radical who wanted to overthrow the Roman government. Another was a tax collector, uh, basically a traitor to the Jewish people and uh, colluded with Rome. Uh, four, and maybe up to seven, we don't know exactly, were, were fishermen. And the others were common craftsmen or tradesmen of the time. But something happened after the resurrection. These ordinary, flawed disciples started a movement that still exists today. So when Peter and John were arrested and they had to stand before the Sanhedrin and uh, in, in Acts, in the book of Acts, that in Acts 4.13 it says, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. In Acts chapter 17, verse 6, it's these bold, uneducated followers that, as it says in Acts 17, turned the world upside down. The entirety of God's mission of starting the early church hinged on these rather ordinary people. That's the whole point of this series. Who were these first followers of Jesus? Who were the 12 disciples? Well, what, what are we going to learn from them? Well, today we're going to start at the beginning, and we're probably going to start in a way that maybe you didn't quite see coming. We're, we're going to start with Mary. Mary is the first disciple of Christ. Now, for those of you who have been with West Bradenton, you know we did an entire series on Mary last year, and so we're going to revisit some of that, but we're also going to dig a little deeper into who she was. So if you want to catch up on a whole series about, about Mary, you can look at our archive and see it there. Here's where we're going to begin, though. Your significance is found in God's plans. God uses ordinary people with extraordinary faith. Who was Mary? Should we care about her? What's her place in the New Testament? Well, she lived in an insignificant vi village named Nazareth, far, far from the religious epicenter where we see Zechariah met Gabriel in another part of the Gospels. And we learn in John chapter 1, verse 46, that Nazareth wasn't exactly uh, a favorite place of people. It, 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 we see there, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was it was a town known for its corruption. It was a town known for prostitution. It was not exactly a favorable place. So Mary and Joseph were common, plain, ordinary people. They were hardworking. They were poor. And they're from a part of the region that wasn't exactly favored. So when Jesus started his ministry, people 
discounted him because of his family background. And we actually see that in Mark chapter 6. So get your Bibles out. We're going to be looking at a, several verses, a couple of main passages today. We're going to be looking at Mark 6. We'll also be looking at John chapter 19. But in Mark 6, we see uh, Jesus' background here, and it, it pertains really to Mary and Joseph, his parents. So Mark 6, beginning in verse 1. He left there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things, they said? What is this wisdom that has been given to him, and how are these miracles performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Jonas, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his brothers and sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his household. He was not able to do a miracle there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages teaching. So when Jesus started his ministry, people discounted him because of where he was from. And really, this passage in Mark 6 reveals more about Jesus' parents than it does him. It's the fact that Jesus was raised here, this was his background, and the people, it says, there were offended by Jesus, clearly a reflection of how the town viewed themselves and how the town viewed Joseph and Mary. So Mary, as the first follower of Christ, is insignificant in every way. We don't see her family mentioned in the Bible. She's a young woman, potentially a teenager when she has Jesus. She is from this small, rough town. So on a status scale, we're talking about somebody who's a zero. If we were to, to rate people, which we shouldn't do, but if we were to rate people and have a zero to 10 status scale, Mary, Mary, would, be, Mary would be a zero. And yet, God favors her. In Luke chapter 1, verse 28, it says, And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. God favors the faithful. Your significance is found in your dedication to him. Let me ask you a question. Who shared Christ with you? Just take a moment and, and think about that. You know, who, who is someone who has shared Christ with you? How are, how are you saved? Somebody had to share Jesus with you. You had to hear it from someone. Perhaps for some, uh, it was something like a Billy Graham crusade or a pastor in a service, and that's how God saved you. Awesome. God uses lots of different means to get the gospel to people. But I would imagine for most of you, most of you watching this, I would imagine that it was someone insignificant who shared Christ with you. Now, maybe they were significant in your life, but it's not like the, the person who shared Christ with you was famous or powerful or a billionaire or some big influencer. I mean, there are plenty of examples of people who are those things and who are followers of Christ and who share Christ. But for most of us, it was somebody who the world would view as common that shared Jesus. And in this way, the person is most significant for you because they are the ones who took the time to share Christ with you. Significance is not found in who you are. Even if you are a billionaire, it's not found in who you are. Significance is found in who Christ is. So what are we doing to share this message? How are we doing as disciples? The stats aren't good. Now, maybe you're the exception, but the statistics aren't good. 82% of people are receptive to an invitation to church. 82% are receptive, meaning people hear you out. The vast majority of people out there will hear you out on going to church, hearing about Jesus. But here's the sad part. Only 2% of church members will invite someone to church in a given year. So you've got 8 out of 10 people, over 8 out of 10 people, who are receptive to going to church, but only 2% of church members are even inviting someone. We're not doing what we should be doing. It's a good thing that whoever shared Jesus with you didn't give up on you. They were willing to do it. 
One of the most significant spiritual endeavors you can undertake is simply not giving up on the power of the gospel, not giving up on worship, not giving up on church, continuing that rhythm and that pattern of being in the fellowship of the saints and sharing Christ with others. Now, what made Mary significant? Obviously, it was not her background. Obviously, it was not herself. What made Mary significant was God's plan for her. What she did do was demonstrate courage. She was the courage to be the first follower of Jesus, and she submitted to the will of God. God will use the courage of ordinary people to complete his extraordinary plans. How does she respond to the angel Gabriel telling her about God's plan for the virgin birth? You can only imagine that. You're going to give birth and it's going to be a virgin birth. What is her response in Luke 1.38? I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. Mary had incredible courage from the onset of learning God's will for her life. She would be at the cross with Jesus. She would be in the upper room with the other disciples. Yes, she was insignificant in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of God, he had a plan for her. And maybe you're insignificant in the eyes of the world, but let me tell you, God has a plan for you. I also want you to note something. Mary's obedience took her to places of danger, certainly. I mean, she was at the foot of the cross. But Mary's obedience also took her to some mundane places as well. You know, God's plan for your life isn't always exotic and extravagant. Let's think about how God's plan for Mary began. She began God's mission by potty training Jesus, by teaching him how to eat, by teaching the Son of God, God himself in the flesh, to walk and to talk. She was a mom. That's what she did. A very ordinary task to begin the mission that God has for her. But it was absolutely necessary. What if the Son of God had never been potty trained? What if the Son of God had not been taught to talk properly? He ended up being a communicator. It would have been a very odd presentation of Jesus if he couldn't talk well and if he was not potty trained. Mary did her job. Very ordinary thing, but a very necessary thing. Ministry is not exotic. Serving in the church is not glamorous. Ministry is ordinary people sharing Jesus in everyday life. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, We have this treasure in clay jars. So this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. Yes, this is something extraordinary that's going on, but we are very ordinary. We're imperfect vessels. We're cracked. We're broken. We're banged up. We're scratched. But we make great containers for good news if you'll just let God use you. Isaiah 64, 8 says, Yet the Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are the work of your hands. So God is the potter. We are the clay. Perhaps you've heard that phrase. It's one that's used often in the church. Let me ask you something. Have you ever seen a potter make something out of clay? The potter starts by pounding the clay to shape it. I mean, it's almost violent. Maybe God's pounding you right now. Maybe his pounding of you is so that you can be shaped by his purposes. He's making a vessel out of you so that you can share the good news. And that's why we exist. We exist for the mission of God. We exist for the gospel. Mary had the courage to do this in the ordinary. Mary had the courage to do this in, in, in some very dangerous situations. But we have the greatest news of all time. Why wouldn't we share that? We have this knowledge that Jesus saves, that he went to the cross to, to shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins, and that anyone who would repent of their sins and believe in him and believe in the power of the resurrection is saved. Why wouldn't we share that with people? We should. We have the only way to get to God, which is through Christ. God wants everyone saved, but the way is exclusive. It only is, happens through Jesus Christ. We've got to share that with people so that they can be saved and come into the kingdom of God, so that they don't spend eternity under condemnation in hell, and that they spend eternity in the presence of their Creator. So the courage to follow Christ requires complete surrender. 
John's Gospel reveals a story about Mary and Jesus at a wedding. This occurs in John chapter 2. So you can go read that on your own. It's the first several verses of John chapter 2. I'll tell you the background of the story. Uh, there's a marriage at Cana, and it's a town, Cana, and Jesus' mother is invited. And Jesus and his disciples accompany her to the wedding. And there's, uh, there's something that happens. It's, it's really a, a huge cultural mistake. It's a big embarrassment for the for the wedding party, the wine runs out. It's, it's not something you want to happen. It was a very, it was a faux pas. And, and Mary wants Jesus to do something about it. She knows her son, at this point, she knows her son has a, has a secret to reveal and that he is the Messiah. And so Mary's thinking maybe this is an opportunity for him to do this, to show his power. And, what, and, and Jesus responds to her. He says, what you are expecting will not happen here. My true revelation will not occur today. So Jesus is telling her, it's not your timing. It's my timing. And I love Mary's response. Remember how she responded to the angel Gabriel? I'm the Lord's servant. I'll do whatever God wants. How does she respond in John chapter 2, verse 5? She says, do whatever he tells you. That's what his mom, Mary, that's what Jesus' mom, Mary, told the servants. Do whatever he tells you. And Mary's submitting to Christ. And from this point on in the text, John chapter 1, John chapter 2, um, Mary kind of, fades into the background a little bit. But she would surface again at the cross. So in John's gospel, we see her at the beginning of his gospel, we see her at the end. We see her at the marriage of Cana and we see her at the cross. And we see her role, a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. Mary begins the narrative, Jesus finishes the narrative. And this 2,000 year old miracle brings meaning to our salvation. Jesus turned the water into wine. That was his first miracle recorded in John. If you look at kind of the, the meaning behind this, the, the fact that the wine had run out meant that the celebration had run out. And that's what sin does in our life. Sin removes the celebration. What does Jesus do? He restores the wine. What does Jesus do in your life? He restores our relationship with God. Jesus offers what we cannot have on our own. And when Jesus held up the cup of wine at the Last Supper, I mean, we can only wonder if the disciples recalled that very first miracle. But Mary gets it right. She starts us at the right point. Do whatever he tells you. A different scene emerges at the end of John's Gospel because Mary there is beneath the cross. And I want to take you to John chapter 19. So get your Bibles again. Let's read just a, a couple of verses here in John chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 25. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Here we see Jesus stripped of his humanity. You know, he's taking on the sins of the world. He's stripped of his human humanity to take on the sins of humanity. The soldiers have just gambled for his clothes. He's dying on a cross. This was really the worst outcome reserved for the, the bottom of society. It's a terrible way to die. Mary does not speak a word here. In fact, John, in this passage, as we just read in John 19, John offers very little about her. But she's there. She's hiding in the shadow of the cross. Just like all the previous 33 years, she was with Jesus. And this passage takes us with Mary back to the marriage at Cana where it all began. The last time we saw Mary in John's gospel was at the marriage of Cana. So we see her at the beginning, we see her at the end. And where Jesus had told her at the marriage at Cana, my hour has not yet come. And if you read John's gospel, you're going to notice the theme of that term hour. And it means death. My death has not yet approached, is what Jesus told his mother at the marriage of Cana. So that first hour occurs in John chapter 2. Jesus talking to his mom, saying, my hour has not yet come. The last time we see it, we say hour and referencing death many times in John's gospel, and the last time we see it is right here uh, in John chapter 19, where Jesus says to John, take care of my mom. Only two places Mary appears in, the, in John's gospel, and they are at these two hours, the first hour, and the last hour. And now we learn the hour was the destination of the cross. 
And it's at the cross that Mary saw and Mary fully understood the son that she loved now bore her sins. John 19, 28 is an absolutely brutal verse. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. Now, understand, here's Mary, the caring mother who would have done anything to quench her son's thirst. I mean, how many times have, has, has your child asked, I'm thirsty, will you get me, or your grandchild asked, I'm thirsty, get me something to drink. I mean, here's a caring mother at the foot of the cross watching her son die, and her son says, I'm thirsty. She would have done anything to quench her son's thirst, but now she must hide in the shadow of the cross that bears her sins. Jesus' story does not end on the cross, thankfully. Mary's story does not end here either. In fact, the last time that we see Mary is, is in Acts chapter 1. She's gathered in the upper room. So a lot of times, unfortunately, people kind of leave her at the cross. That's not where her story ends in the Bible. Her story ends actually in Acts chapter 1, the last time that we see her. And she's not gathered at the foot of the cross. She's gathered in the upper room with the apostles praying. Why is she there? What began with, I am the Lord's slave. I'll do whatever he tells me to do. That's what she told the angel Gabriel. I'll do whatever God tells me to do. What began with, I am the Lord's slave, ends with, I am Jesus' ambassador. Mary was the first disciple of Jesus. Mary was also one of the first missionaries. In fact, it was Jesus' mom who took his good news to the ends of the earth. We as the church follow in her footsteps. She was a gospel ambassador. and We should be gospel ambassadors as well.